further ado, I'm handing it to you, uh, Sabine, for this uh, session. So if you also could introduce yourself, then just uh, continue straight on. Um, enjoy. Great. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to give you a little talk today about our nine months project in Africa and remotely done. Um, I'm Sabine. I'm a senior associate with Inside Share now for about is it six years now, quite a long time, doing lots of lovely projects and many of them abroad. Um, but yeah, the pandemic hit and we had to change. So I'm going to share my screen with you and talk you through the, the fellowship and what we at Inside Share have done in order to, yeah, do it remotely. I think for many of you, that will be very interesting. So here is our first slide and uh -huh. I can't use, yes. So just a wee introduction um, of the places where we ended up working remotely. And as you might not know, these are some of the most remote parts um, in Africa. Um, some of the countries um, have regions where, you know, it's hard to get a signal and that was our big worry. Can we do this? But we, we did it. <laughs> and I'll tell I'll talk you through how we did it. So first up, we had uh, engaged uh, already over many years partners in different areas. For example, the Maasai in Kenya and uh, in South Africa, we knew Amava Oluntu, a really great organization. And so we approached them and said, um, we would love to do a really intensive project and program for young people and women to learn the PV. Um, process really well and to capture stories from their culture and capture their culture really well to use it to learn and to pass on all their knowledge to their fellow community members because that was a big concern that um, a lot of young people are disengaged from the elders and from traditional knowledge and when we reached out to our colleagues and friends that we have made over the years um, we had a resounding um, enthusiasm for this project and with the pandemic we obviously couldn't just go out and spend time in person we had to figure out how to do this remotely so Nick engaged me and said Sabine could you do this and I was like oh my god <laughs> that's a big project to do but uh, we had really great meetings to plan this and to think it through and we started with it and this is a little glimpse of the wonderful people that came to be part of the fellowship. Um, we engaged 38 youth and women from six different uh, communities that were in four different countries. Almost half of them were women, which was really important to us to really push that um, diverse engagement, especially with the most marginalized and unheard voices in, in often in some of those communities as well. And as you see in the bottom, we had a group of excellent mentors that without them, we couldn't have done this. And we knew we needed these people on the ground who were not only knowing the communities very well, but they were also had very much a, a profile in the community. They were trusted and uh, working hard with other community members, well known, some of them really um, crucial knowledge keepers in their communities. And they were all really excited about this project and came on board and said, yes, we can help. We can take the youth and bring them together, make sure that, you know, there's a bit of a senior person in the group that can hold the space for the youth while I'll engage with them remotely. So what did we do in these nine months? We structured the whole project into three phases to see how we get on. We kept it very flexible. We had to be flexible because we knew this is the first time. Will it work? Will people be able to learn from each session to session? So you see all these numbers are equivalent to the weeks that we spent. So each week we had one session with each hub. So pretty much the hub was meeting for the day. Every week they engaged with us. And then we had a few breaks in between and we had a few reflections as well, where we wanted to find out, you know, how did you like this process? Did it go well? Did you miss anything? 
and yeah, I adapted each phase to the phase that was before, just because we, we realized, okay, maybe we need a bit more training in certain aspects that still wasn't quite get, gotten across. And then in the final phase, really helping them to become more independent and more, you know, using their newfound skills to facilitate in their communities, pass on these skills to community members, engage them in the topics. And because we were very much um, looking into COP26 happening in Glasgow this November, we were actually proposing to them, would you like to do another film before the end of the fellowship to talk about climate change and how it affects your communities? And we would like to try to engage our partners to share at COP26 because Nick has had the opportunity to go there. And all the hubs were enthusiastic about that. So that was the final thing we did in August. And I'll tell you more how that went down. So we started off with the basic process. Many of you have done PV and know the, the different steps that we use in, in, the, in the method. And we wanted to figure out how can we emulate this in an online version. And we figured in each week we have a certain set of things that we want to get across and that build on each other like we do in a normal workshop. So starting from the introductions and getting letting the group uh, get to know each other, we then started with more tech learning, looking at the mobile phones that we introduced. Each hub had a set of kit that the mentors um, uh, acquired beforehand, a tripod, microphones, and then they went on to do several exercises in the following weeks just to uh, you know, realize, okay, how does this work? PV exercises that we have done many times, topic exploration exercises like the river of life, storyboarding, all these fun things. I try to figure out how can we send them these exercises. And in the end, they went off, had their filming activities and then had to edit as well on the mobile phone. Some of them reverted to a laptop if they had one. But yeah, it culminated in local screenings as well, where they shared their films to the local community. And that was basically the first phase, really deep dive into participatory video. Now, I actually thought the best thing to do this would be almost like doing it in person, giving these instructions that we give for an exercise, which are usually very short and precise and uh, usually very visual. So I actually used my funny cards of uh, drawings that I wanted to you know, give this visual explanation because of course the fellows spoke good English, many of them very good English. It, it is a visual tool and I wanted to keep the visual aspect. So sending little videos of me presenting the instructions to an activity together with one of our little A4 sheets that had the instructions printed as well. So they could check back to the printed version, which you know told them roughly how long will it take? What do we, do, what do we need for each exercise? So every week they got a little bunch of videos and little sheets of um, uh, remembering you know, printed sheets to read up in the morning and do it by themselves. So each day when, when they were starting the work, sometimes I got messages in the morning, Sabine, I don't understand activity three. <laughs> and I quickly gave them some advice. And then in the afternoon, we had our reflection call. So before the call, I always send them messages. How is it going? Can you send me your flip charts or can you send me the videos for your exercises? And so I received on WhatsApp usually because they compress the video so it's easy to send from remote places. I received these flip charts and then I could tell, ah, okay, that reflection is a little bit shallow. I think I need to poke a bit more. Or I saw the videos and I thought, oh, okay, let's talk in the call what didn't go well or what did go well in this in this video and it was really nice to have the afternoon like almost an hour we were chatting through all these different activities you see on the bottom there many of you might notice that's a paper edit i think you probably have worked with a paper edit before 
and it looks very nice, but this is not the first iteration I've received from that group. They sent me a very jumbled paper edit to start with. And in our reflection call, I said, oh, I think we need to do this again. And I explained more how it works step by step. And so they went off and then they sent me this really wonderful paper edit back. So really, I had to really dig deep sometimes to get this, yeah, get this connection and make sure that the activities are well understood. And here you see us, that's what, you know, uh, every week I had usually on two, over two or three days, I had um, the calls in the afternoon slotted in with the different hubs, either on WhatsApp or on Zoom, whatever worked. As you can see on the bottom picture, people were out in the open because they had to find the top of a hill where there was a good signal. So they called me from the back of the truck. The mentor had a car to drive them up to the hill to give us the call. And some of them had a little office space that they could hire for, for the weekly activities. So they called me from the office space and it was fantastic. I didn't believe myself that it would be that we would get such a good connection with all of the fellows through the video calls and really reflect on activities and they ask a lot of questions. So I really felt, yes, they, they have, they've completely engaged and they're really wanting to learn. Now we also wanted for them to learn from each other because of course, with having six different communities, very different cultures, it would be wonderful if they can train each other or show each other their work, their films. And so we had several hub exchanges, one-on-one, -on -one, like two different hubs meeting online. But then we also had the big exchange, really fantastic event in the final phase where we tried to get everyone into the room. And it was, yeah, it was actually quite emotional. <laughs> that was a great celebration and people watched their films before the call. So all of these fellows saw the other work from the other people and it really helped them to understand and to be inspired like, wow, this hub did such a nice thing. So here is one quote from Sandile who uh, watched, he was meeting, he was meeting the Maasai hub in Kenya and he was so inspired to see their film and learn about their culture. And uh, yeah, he thought, wow, we city people, uh, we've lost so much of that. And uh, I want to engage more uh, with my past and the culture that, you know, I've, I've lost a bit. So it was a really powerful way of, um, bringing him from the Cape Town community, from the, from the shanty town to meet people that are still very connected with their culture. Now challenges. <laughs> that's, a, that's I think really good for, for all of us to look at what happened when we did this and what went maybe was really hard to do because of course with the remoteness comes the problem that as a facilitator, you don't read so much how people work together. You only experience in the reflection calls, you see the flip charts, the video footage, what people tell you. So sometimes it was really hard for me to find out if there was an issue with group dynamics. And we did have in some hubs where people had to really first get over those hurdles of working well together and um, lots of big egos clashing and uh, needing to really get that feeling for what PV is, that it's a group activity, that we need to learn to listen to each other, that we need to learn to respect each other. And that was hard for some, but it did work out in the end that people had their talks, the mentor was really crucial in helping with that to you know, make sure if I felt like there's something wrong, I called the mentor and asked, is, there, is everything all right with the group? What can we do? And you know, they, they usually sort it out. Now technology, I mentioned we used the mobile phones as a kit. We got for each hub two sets so that they could potentially split up in two groups. There were about four to seven uh, participants in each hub. So that was really good. And some of the phones even were crucial because some of the young fellows didn't have access to mobile phones or had really crappy little ones that don't do any photos and videos. 
and we used the tripod attachment and microphones that they could clip in and we used certain apps and that was actually a bit tricky to really get across how to use the video making app itself where you can focus focus lock so that you know have a nice stable image with a focus uh, on the face for example that was a bit tricky and i did send them little videos showing my own phone screen explaining this is what you click this is what you click and actually that worked quite well but still it was hard for the whole group i realized not everyone in the group ended up uh, learning the apps as much as some people that were much much more tech savvy so there was a little bit that thought oh this is hard but other than that i think the technology worked well it's just a matter of um, editing on the phone as well was hard because it's very small and that means it's harder for a group to do as a participatory activity so it becomes a bit more of a okay someone's doing it the others try to see what are they doing and they try to give the phone around so that everyone can have a shot but that's obviously harder for me as a long distance facilitator to to really see how that works well so something to to think through and for us we hope with more funding we can actually provide a small laptop that would be able to, to for the editing it's much better now connectivity yes that was also an issue because people were really remote and here you see that a team in the eastern cape in south africa on a beautiful sunny day um, going up the hill to get a good signal but in some hubs it was really difficult and sometimes we just couldn't manage the call so there was the odd week where we had to say oh we try again next week it's not working and we managed to do voice messages on whatsapp so people could still send questions still send me a, a little reflection on whatsapp and i could re react to that but it was harder for those groups for sure but i must say even though with six different hubs i think it was only one that had the, the most problems and the others adapted and found solutions no innovations oh that's actually i had the innovations already so that was what uh, i've just explained how we used them um, actually i uh, let me go back because i wanted to share with you on this slide the the flip classroom approach that we used for this um, to give activities out the teams work independently then they sent me their flip charts back and uh, we have a reflection call that was really what we tried out with this process. And I think it worked really well because people were doing activities. Sometimes they were rushing some, but we could realize and we could give them in the next week a follow-up activity when we realized, guys, you need to improve this. This didn't work. And it was really, really good. We had to sometimes adapt the sessions, but with that flexibility we had in, in the project, we could do that really well. And, really make sure that the skills are properly conveyed. So let's go to the outcomes because that is the most important part. As you can imagine with different cultures coming together and sharing their, their knowledge and training these young people who had, we encouraged them to go and meet their elders to, for the first time, some of them, it was so encouraging to hear that they were welcomed by the elders, that the elders were really keen to share knowledge and to make sure that the youth are not losing it and not running off to the cities, which is a big problem in some of the parts where the fellows worked. And uh, it was powerful to see this reflection from the young people and the acknowledgement of the value of their culture that they have. So really for us, that was one of the, the big outcomes of this project, this connection between young people and their knowledge holders in the community. And similar um, in the Maasai Hub, Scholar told us, you know, she's really worried about the westernization and different methods, different ways of living, the people not wearing their traditional clothes anymore, not doing all the traditional rituals anymore and she was really keen 
with her group to capture them and to proudly share what is what is their what is their culture and why it is important. Now resilience, part of this project was really to help the groups to look into how can they be more resilient as hubs, as, as video hubs, but also in terms of how do they appear in, in the world, how can they raise their voices and protect their land, protect their, their livelihoods. And here you hear somewhere one of the mentors who is uh, you know, very much aware of the threats that the Maasai in Tanzania are facing by tourism and um, projects to conserve nature, but by kicking the people off the land. And this project really gives them an opportunity to go and share these stories, these, um, yeah, the way they suffer through these uh, evictions and make a case for themselves. So really important that part of this video project is raising this level of awareness amongst their people, but also outside to fight for their rights. And the same in, in this other region, we worked at Lake Tokana, where actually three different tribal uh, cultures were mixed in our hub. They really loved working and learning from each other and, and creating a great communication between each other because there's a lot of conflict between the different tribes in that area. And that we, we were really happy about that our mentor was very keen to bring in youth from the different tribes in that part. And they were very keen to spread around and to share and to promote that piece. Really good. Regeneration. Definitely a, a big part of this um, regeneration, while we also were very keen on engaging as many women as we can, because we know that women are a powerful aspect of that in terms of the, often the women are the ones growing food and caring for the children and raising their communities in that way. So empowering them was really important to us to not only you know, make videos, but really to enhance that sense of having a voice in their community um, and yeah, making a change for the better. And in this case, the um, Ahmadi Bar Hub were very much interested in, in nutrition and in their traditional crops, which is another thing that Westernization is trying to change, bringing in lots of cheap crops grown with fertilizers, GMO crops, um, and disregarding their traditional local crops, which grow so well in the area, of course. So they made a film about that, and they filmed how you can actually get better nutrition by eating the local varieties. And that was really powerful. And here in Fanuzile also talking about language, which I think is very important because some of the fellows were a bit shy and were a little bit embarrassed that their English wasn't good. And we really said to them, no, it's, that's not a problem. It's your language is powerful and it doesn't matter. We, we can translate it. And he was so inspired by the Nyai Nyai Hap because their English was really good, but in all their films, they spoke their native language and were very proud to share their stories in their native language. So for him, that was really nice to see. And I think that's important that they understand that their culture is important, their language is important, and we don't need to always speak the English. We have subtitles. <laughs> and the nature connection was a big part of the filming and how you know the hubs were all, actually most of the hubs revert in their films to nature and this important part of their culture and how they um, how they go to certain places for rituals how it's a really important part um, for their spirituality so that was really powerful to see how part of their life is actually ingrained the, the basically the keeping the nature alive is part of their traditions as part of their ingrained spirituality and it's really beautiful to see how all the young people who you know are drifting off to the cities or want to you know uh, leave the areas how they were actually 
reconnecting with some of these rituals and some of these sacred places. And in this case, um, you see here the Maasai visiting a sacred place that some of the youth have never been before. And it was very special as part of the video assignment that they managed to go to a new place and speak to a specific elder. That was very exciting for them and very, they were all very nervous. But yeah, it was very powerful for them to regain this connection to some of their inherent cultural places. And uh, yes, uh, Sinagugu is the mentor for the Ahmadi Bahab and he was an absolute brilliant mentor and he really gets the problem that they face and that they need to be proud of their indigenous roots and that they you know, need to see the value of the way they live, of the way they use the land and work with the land. And that was one of the best um, impacts of this project with the mentors we had, that they really nurtured that connection to land and to culture. But also I loved this really short quote and really important quote in some of the groups, we def definitely felt there is a discrepancy between men and women. And it was super nice to see that the women grew in their group and felt like, yes, I can do what the men do too, which was really powerful. And also just to mention that in some cultures there are harmful practices that some of the women felt like I can now speak out about this. I can encourage women to do other things instead, to get an education like Laura talked about. So that was also really interesting to see that women talked about women issues amongst their, their peers and could encourage them through the video making. And the final outcome, as I already mentioned, we asked them, do you want to make a film for COP26 and talk about climate change? How's that affecting your communities? And so all the fellows agreed and they wanted to go on a little pilgrimage to some of the sacred sites and speak to some of their elders about climate change, how the elders have experienced it, um, what has already affected their livelihood. And to our surprise, they all sent clips. It was really, it was a bit of a chase. We worked with Channel 4 News and they were very strict. And when are you sending? And you know, you can imagine with these guys filming and needing to send high quality video files from their weak signal spots in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it was very nerve wracking and they did manage to send everything. And on the beginning of COP, it was I think a Monday night when the conference started at seven o'clock on the UK Channel 4 News was a four minute report. Here I'm watching it from my home and it was very emotional to see the stories of the indigenous hubs on the television screen that probably millions of people watched that night, um, representing their issues, calling on leaders to do something. So that representation we have not anticipated for in this project at the start, that they could be in national news, it could be heard by so many people, while they also obviously use their films amongst each other and their own cultures to, to share amongst their own communities. So yes, I think that's the end of this for now, but we have obviously time for questions now. But if you want to follow us, if you're not following us already, there's a few places to find us. And yeah, I'll, I'll get out and look what questions you might have about the process, about the, how we, the outcomes, what you want to know more about. Yeah, it's great. I'm just gonna take this opportunity for me to kick off the first question. Because what the, what I'm really curious is, I, I know participatory video is is really about the group and together, and the process is really important. But there is still a, a film at the at the end of the process that results in that. And I was wondering, did they try the groups themselves to do uh, some outreach with the films they had produced? Did they maybe do a screening or did they maybe, um, can you tell a little bit about yeah. 
type of activities because you, you mentioned uh, Channel 4 News and you mentioned things that sort of were facilitated by Inside Share as part of their outreach. I was wondering, any initiative by themselves and, and to what results? Could you speak a little bit to that, uh, Sabine? Yes. So, of course, the even in the first phase, they had their first little screening of their first uh, films. They were all quite short and they all went off to go to a certain community place or arrange in the community space to do a screening. And then they did another one. A bit, mostly it was a bit bigger the second time around um, and engaging more people, partly because that was also very nice that they got to the community knew them as the filmmakers. So that was really amazing that more people came and wanted to see who are these filmmakers that we have now in our community. Um, and some of the hubs have completely run with the idea. They've, you know, for us, it was important to figure out how to build this sustainability within their hub that after nine months, it's not just finished. And, but they are, some of them actually have started their Facebook profiles. They post about each of their members, um, inviting new people. They went out to facilitate with some youth groups. Um, another hub engaged with the government to get funding. And I'm actually waiting on updates and crossing my fingers that they got maybe some government funding. And, and one of the Maasai hubs um, found out that the education curriculum in Kenya changed that would include now indigenous uh, cultural education, which they were like, oh my God, we can be part of this. We can use our videos um, to share with the children about our culture this way, which we thought, wow, that's an amazing, you know, they spotted this um, thing to, to use PV for, which I will also chase up um, how that is going. I'm sure that is brooding in the background. So yeah, each hub has, done different things to continue. Some fellows were so inspired by learning about video that they wanted to get more education. And even though we were like, oh, but don't leave the hub, but we are so happy that they found an inspiring new path in their career and wanting to bring journalism and education back to their communities. So that's also very nice. Wow. Yeah, thank you, Sabine, for that uh, explanation. I saw a uh, sit -in. You had a question about motivation. Would you like to, to speak a little bit? Because I see you yourself are also working with uh, indigenous uh, groups in Cambodia. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is the main reason I'm attending this online <laughs> session. I, yeah, the more I uh, listen to your sharing, the more I can relate to the current project uh, we're conducting with uh, yeah, Cambodian indigenous uh, people yes uh, regardless of the our countryside here yeah, we count uh, yeah, a few dozens of uh, ethnic groups so uh, since 2019 yeah yeah we've been working with yeah uh, in two provinces Kaches and that i can help you <laughs> i spell uh, the names of the province later for your reference so uh, our challenge was to actually motivate uh, our team to work online with uh, indigenous group. So yeah, like you said, it's it was already a challenge to uh, get them interested in uh, this kind of content or even the, the, the vice uh, themselves. So this actually discouraged the team. I mean, our organizing team to not uh, really pursue such online course with uh, uh, our indigenous uh, yeah, fellows. So how did you overcome this kind of challenge? Yeah, I see that you still run, uh, run the online course with them with some visual materials. So maybe you can uh, like expand <laughs> your experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like we, we knew that it would be hard the, the online way, but we also um, had enough funding in place to say to the mm. mentors, the people that take part, we want to give them a small stipend as part of the training. Mm. Obviously, at the end, they always get certificates, which is really important and that they acknowledge the, the training they had. But the stipends, uh, food, budget and transport to help them to meet up in a certain place. And they had vouchers for their Wi-Fi um, to use, which was important. Um, and um, some of the hubs had a place that they rented for their work day. And that was really for us important to, to have this, these things in place. And that 
was definitely not maybe not needed for all hubs because they knew about PV already. Some of them were already engaged before, but it was definitely really important for some hubs where the youth are struggling financially and you know in, in some of the places where they live it's really hard um, to even get a job and so we wanted to provide that as an outset and I think that was very important to have that in place and I think the mentors were important because they knew some of the youth in their communities and they could explain to them and most of our mentors have either done PV themselves before mm. or they were engaged in, in, in media in other ways. So they knew the value of it. So they could really well explain and, and uh, share their enthusiasm with the youth. So that might be another thing that wow. you, and maybe you have, I don't know if you have already PV films from similar communities or from the communities where you're trying to engage to do a screening and, and share with them and say, this is, the type of thing we want to do this is the the messages you can make yourselves if we if we train you so that could be in a way to engage people by sharing what it's like this is the film you could make if you mm. come to our training so actually the mentors are based uh, in the communities yes. of ip yes but that uh, was you were trained by your team before right some of them were, but not all of the mentors were. So for some of the mentors, the course itself was almost like a training that they attended themselves. Mm. But because they were a bit older and um, ah, I see, I see. they were a bit more knowledgeable already. And some of the mentors were either, you know, I think one of them is a professor slash works in education. Another one is a teacher. Another one um, was is a community worker. So people that were engaging in the community already, but we're of a bit of a higher status. Maybe Nick, is there anything you might want to add to that? Because you engaged with the groups from the start. Yeah, I think I think you mentioned that the stipend was, was important. I think um, the the communities that we worked with, they they all had requested this this training. So we were we were meeting a, a, a demand that was clearly there. Um, of course, they would have maybe preferred a face-to-face -face training like we used to do in the old days, but um, there was nothing we could do with COVID. So there was no alternative and everyone understood that. Mm. Um, they, I guess they also probably had a bit more time on their hands because of COVID restricting their uh, opportunities to move around to, to, to find work and that kind of thing. So they were eager to fill their time with something uh, productive and, and fun mm. um, and I think you know the the first phase was really fun it was lots of activities lots of games you know the way we teach video skills is all all based on games and mm. so Sabine did a great job to really translate that how we would do it face to face in it, with the distance learning by by sending really simple instructions and and encouraging them to do these games and these group activities. So I think it was a real highlight for them every week to, to come and meet. It was only one day per week that we um, asked for their, for their commitment. Maybe that we didn't make that clear before. One day per week, roughly, more or less, sometimes a little bit more as they were starting to get more, more committed and making films, then maybe they would spend more time uh, two or three days in that week in the week. But at the beginning for the first a few months it was one one day per week that they would meet and we also provided a budget for food so they could have a meal together and uh, transportation some of the fellows were living far away i mean the mentors played a massive role in in recruiting the kind of young people that were that would be dedicated and that would have a dedication and, and commitment as well mm. so it was it was very much um we were very much down to, down to the mentors and we had some troubles at the beginning uh, we picked the wrong mentor in one of the hubs uh, just because um, it turned out that the woman we picked was was overcommitted. She had a job it's doing something else. Um, mm -hmm. But luckily, we we found somebody else uh, who stepped in at short notice. And I mean, in a couple of cases, these mentors, they didn't know us really very well. Sinigugu oh. uh, didn't know us from Amadiba. Leon in Nainai didn't know us. Um, so it was a bit of a risk for, for us and for them. 
Um, and it, it worked out well in the end. But, you know, I think the, the key thing was that these people, we found the right people who are really uh, important activists in their communities, um, who uh, believe in, in the mission that we're, that, that, you know, what we stand for. And they see video as a very powerful, important tool. So they, so we understand each other and we shared a lot in, in that sense. And once, once, once they understood what, how we, what, how we worked and the potential that this, this tool has, then I think um, it, it all fit together. So uh, I, it start with your team already agreeing on the effectiveness of, of this uh, online tr yeah, training or mentorship, right? Is, I mean, you are, I mean, as organizing members, yeah, from, from distance, you already agree that this approach would work even if it is online and from distance. Yeah, we, we were hoping, and obviously we knew that we need that local support, like not just us send, you know, doing an online video with just the young people, I think would have been too hard to- I to see. So you actually uh, build a kind of anticipate a bridge between them. Okay. Through the, through the local mentors. And as I said, some of them were already partners and have engaged in other PV projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah knew but as nick said they knew they understood the mission and the the power of video making so they were on board very quickly and uh, within weeks we had an, a really wonderful work relationship where we could exchange and uh, get feedback from them and they were very much uh, so uh sabine how, how many uh, are from your side i mean your own team from distance so I was facilitating all of the workshops and the reflection sessions and my team of helping Nick and Grace um, and later also Tanya helping maybe with communicating things or joining in the hub calls in the big exchange calls where we met everyone together. So, it, it, you know, and Nick obviously helping a lot sometimes when there was any issue to solve to communicate mm. with the mentors. But the face of the project was they saw me the most. <laughs> we always talked. But yeah, behind the scenes, obviously, you need to organize money, money transfers and things like that. So yeah, three I think it, three, three roughly to work okay. behind the scenes, yeah. Okay, but how, yeah. Okay. how, how again, how many mentors in, in the community? The, the mentors in the community for each hub one. So we had one. six communities. So six mentors. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Maybe I should, <laughs> I should add as I should add as well, Sitten. Um, and it's it's really nice to to meet you. By the way, um, heard about your work. <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, I should add that uh, Egbert uh, was also present at a very important um, meeting gathering that we had in in uh, South Africa in 2019. It was a video for change uh, mm -hmm. Africa gathering, skills sharing. Uh, workshop over four or five days and most of the groups were present at that meeting most of the groups that we worked with this year for the fellowship that that was a, like a seed that was we planted a seed but it wasn't um it, it was a very much collaborative process and so mm -hmm. this fellowship and everything that we do in fact as insight share everything we do when we work with indigenous groups it's all led by indigenous people. Everything that we do, everything we strategize, we plan, we deliver, is all requested and planned and strategized by our indigenous partners. It's not, it's, it, these are not our ideas that we're imposing. We're following their lead. We have certain uh, advisors in our, that we work with very closely, like some of them are the mentors, Samuel from the Maasai, for example, um, who really have the vision in their, in their heads of why they need video, why they want to establish their own autonomous uh, indigenous media and what it means for them and what they can do with it. And, and, that, and, and then we, we fill in those gaps, we support them, resource them, train them, but it, it's, it's very much a mission led by them. So that's an important element, I think, in terms of the commitment, starting from that point. And the Africa gathering was a really important moment where we strategized, we shared, we found lots of commonalities across the continent. Indigenous peoples are facing the same challenges across the world, actually. The threats to their land, to their autonomy, sovereignty, 
the threats to their culture and how they want to respond to it is, is very, you know, is also very strategic. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I, I'm, uh, I'm curious, uh, Budi, you're listening in and I know you, you work with a lot of grassroots communities as well. Uh, I've seen some of your work with street children. Can you, after seeing Sabine's presentation, imagine you're giving a training to, to, to groups in Eastern Indonesia all online and then climbing the mountain to find some some signal I'm just curious to get your uh, thoughts on this booty yeah um i'm sorry if my english is not good but i work with the street children is a long time ago long long time ago with we just with a, a small camera handy cam and and yeah we work with, with not not online or but this offline and this long time ago then we used a new camera but we training about the children about how to use the camera how to use the the shoot and how to use the but the the important is not not the result of film result film is a bonus but the I think it's our work is the important is uh, the process about the transition be they can uh, self confidence they can use uh, work together about the community transition community they, they can they can work with and and about perbagai peran about that divide the tasks. Yeah, and who's the be a director? Who's be a cameraman? Who's to be uh, yeah, they, they, they mix with that, and then so they the important say they know, but this film is tell tell themselves about that about story about the living in the street uh, and and they know that this film is milik mereka apa namanya it's theirs it's their own there's there's own yeah. film not others yeah. not the others not me not not yeah because the the, the first time is a, a filmmaker like a Garin make a film about the street children and then they make themselves film film themselves about their their daily life in the street this is interesting some one of the street children about uh see they know they know is but not not just the day, not that every street children in this film is they make be a facilitator in their, their community about everything. Not that not making film, but but about yeah, make make kerajinan. handicrafts. Handicraft and anything about sex, about another about sex education and another day. Yeah. But right now, I, yes, same with, with the others. We use a mobile phone to make the film. And the last, my work is uh, how people in the village in Borobudur knew about their culture, their culture and they make a film about their culture about how make a sugar java sugar and how make this the other and then until now they they make a, a film about their daily life their culture yeah yeah this Thank you so much, Mbudi. And, and just to give 
some some background there's a community called ethno Reflica, where booty is part of and and we've worked together where they gave uh training in participatory video to some uh some of the people that we worked with in a, in a program i was then part of this is even before engaged media and i noticed how their style of training and the games they use is actually quite similar to uh inside shares of course there's some differences but it was really when I when I encountered inside share work, I was really like, wow, it reminded me so much of Budi and Ethno Reflika and the way they did their training. So that was really wonderful uh, to see and to have that experience with uh, with Budi and his friends way uh, way back when. Um, Demi and Claudia have their hands raised, so we're gonna uh, give time to them as well. But uh, thank you so much, Budi, for that sharing. Demi, you were first. Go ahead. Okay. Um. Well, the activities seem all fun. Uh, well, as you've mentioned, like uh, there are games and all, but I'm just curious um, since, uh, as we know, filmmaking, uh, in filmmaking, there's the director, there's the writer, editor, and cinematographer. So I am just cu curious, like for your participants, do you train them for a particular skill? Like for example, cinematography or writing or uh, did uh, any of your participants express that he or she wants to um, develop this particular skill or is it more like a collective effort? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> it, first of all, it's, it's a collective effort. So we start off uh, a normal PV uh, process where everyone learns each of the different skills. And sometimes it naturally crystallizes that one person is maybe very good at editing, but we're, we are always pushing that everyone in the team should learn the basic skills and be fluent with them and be able to use them. Um, and that's, that's really important. And sometimes it was harder to gauge that from the distance. But for, for us, it was important that they work well as a group. Um, they, they all make the decisions together about what they want to do, uh, how they go about it, who's using the camera, who's doing which task at which time. Um, and that we wanted to make sure that from the start, everyone has the same skill set and then they can decide, you know, who takes on which task for a new project, for example. And so, yeah, I think we didn't want to go down that route of dividing up uh, who's doing which task. And I think just like Budi mentioned as well, it's it's the film itself sometimes is not the main outcome. For us, it was really important that they work well as a group and they really discuss the issues and make sure work together on these issues. So that was for us the main the main yeah outcome really. Yeah. Does it answer your question, Demi? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sabine, for the <laughs> explanation. Um, Claudia. Yes. Um, hi again. First of all, um, I'm really, really impressed about all the methodology and the process that you have ex uh, well experimented, I guess, as a first time to go through, you know, Sabine, Nick, I mean, all of Inchad's share. And, uh, and it looks as it has been really, really successful. I mean, of course, hiccups and, and issues along the way is as all first, you know, uh, times project. I mean, it's something that, you know, is part of it, but I'm really, really impressed. And uh, my question is very much regarding how much do you, you would like to put, to use this further alongside, I mean, as soon as travel restriction, you know, hopefully we go back to a kind of more, um, uh, let's say um, reconnected world that we are able to um, you to provide in presence um, workshops and in presence uh, facilitation which I I mean for our experiences uh, um, it's very I mean it provides a different kind of learning experience I would say different uh, in some ways um, the fact that you also are there you can read through some of the issues, for instance, the group dynamics have been that you were referring to, and more of things that you know are less technical and less practical, but it's very, very key for the success also of the project and the group dynamics. So, question is very much how much you, uh, as Indra site share, you see how effective it has been as methodology, 
in using remotely um, at a uh, participatory video and if how do you plan to do to use it in the future and continue to use it in the future alongside being there physically thanks i think nick has a really great ideas <laughs> but for sure uh, it was a test uh, and it was a in, in any way a successful outcome that we i think we're emboldened to continue in that path uh, and maybe combine it with travel but nick has probably some more information on how to go on in the future but we all we all actually like that the fact that we don't need to fly in, in terms of climate change to reduce emissions and so on and that it actually worked so well with the right resources and the right people on on the ground but yeah nick tell us more about the future <laughs> Yeah, well, it's yes, I think um, we will definitely continue using the, the distance learning model, um, whatever happens with travel. Um, hopefully, uh, air travel will be massively curtailed anyway, because that needs to happen. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully we won't be allowed to, tra to travel as much as we were before. Um, <clears throat> and we, we don't we, we we want to really we're aiming to train facilitators or trainers uh, in in the in in the African continent in this case and in Southeast Asia and the different areas that we work with indigenous peoples. Uh, we have done managed to do that in other parts of the world where we've had long a long enough engagement and partnership. For example, in north northwest Mexico, there's a, a women's collective, uh, La Marabunta Filmadora, of Yaki, Raramuri, and Konkak women who are now fully autonomous from Insight Share. They raise their own funding. They get invited uh, to go and offer trainings across the continent, across South Africa, South America. Uh, they recently were in Brazil training Amazonian youth um, and in Ecuador working with indigenous women. They also train uh, academics in Mexican universities. So you have that massive complete role reversal. Um, so it's part of the sort of decolonization, I guess, mission that we're really uh, hoping to be part of and engaged with um, and uh, to, to try and yeah make sure that the, the world relies less on on outside experts having to come in and run these kinds of workshops which you know they they were great but they were very resource heavy so typically we would have done a two-week intensive workshop let's say in Kenya and people would have had to travel a thousand thousand miles to come there and give up a lot of their time leave their families and their livelihoods to come to this hotel or whatever it was where we hosted it and we'd do this really intense two weeks where and then they'd go home with their equipment and in their small teams and then we wouldn't see each other again for at least six months maybe more some in some cases um, because it was such you know a headache to organize another gathering and then so they'd come together there'd be this gap of six months or more where we'd have hardly any contact and things would obviously you know um would go wrong in many cases and and you would lose that momentum so this is a kind of way that to, to plug that gap definitely some kind of face-to-face -face gathering is important and powerful but i think not so much between us and them but more between them as indigenous communities to gather together uh, and to share and build solidarity and build support and, and a resilient um, media network where they can sk share skills. We're, we're looking at the moment, uh, engaging some uh, filmmakers and editors in Kenya and South Africa who could help with the post-production, which has been a massive challenge. Uh, to, like Sabine was mentioning, the Channel 4 News um, challenge well you know it would have been so much easier just to have a really trusted amazing person on the ground some you know a bit maybe like more like a little bit engaged media's model in some ways like have someone really you can trust who's who understands who's from that continent who who can go and you know if necessary travel to the Maasai land and spend two or three days gathering footage getting you know filling up the database that the hard drive helping fine-tune the edit and go back to Nairobi and upload it from Nairobi. That's what that's what we're looking to do. So local trainers and local uh, resource people who can support those kinds of um, and you know people uh, social media influencers. I met in in uh, in Glasgow at the COP26 from Africa. Young young people who are starting to influence social media 
who are mainly from the cosmopolitan areas, but very fascinated by the work we're doing with indigenous groups in their countries that they know nothing about and that they're learning about through the films and wanting to engage and, and connect with. So there's all kinds of ways I think that this ex experience is going to definitely change us uh, forever in the way we work. Beautiful. I look forward to that future, Nick. Thanks. Well, we're, we're you know we've come back from the COP twenty six with quite a few a few ideas and inspirations. Um, the next COP is in Egypt. COP twenty seven is in Egypt, and you know I uh, the vision I have is that all of those communities that you've been introduced to today and more. The ones, the other ones that Egbert that you met in, in and the, you know that we all connected with in in Cape Town, uh, in the Cape Town gathering as well in Ethiopia and Cameroon, the Baka, the Gamo, so on, Sengware, Elias, all those that they should be there at the COP26. They should be hosting an incredible cultural uh, hub in, 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 at the COP26, which which is was uh, is promoting indigenous values and land based, earth based. Uh, values um, from a kind of African centric position um, with video film festivals, with music uh, and, and listening sessions. So, so that's the vision we're, we're starting to build, whether we, whether we do that or not in such a big way, I'm not sure, but it, it's going to start with localized film festivals that are hosted by on, on indigenous territories, um, hosted by indigenous people for indigenous peoples first and foremost and then sort of building momentum as a sort of almost like a, tra a road show traveling road show of, of culture music film uh, which travels up the continent towards Egypt and possibly uh, in uh, with a big finale happening at the cop the cop 27 there wow I, I hope to join from South Africa <laughs> and then all the way up <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, that that sounds beautiful uh, uh, Nick um, just curious, uh, Sarah, you've been listening in and I see from your facial expression, you've been really engaged with everything that was said. Would you like to, I'm just curious on, on your reflection on, or, or maybe you have a question or would like to add something because I just saw you were very engaged uh, with it all. I am loving learning about all of these projects. So I've been taking notes of all, all the different organizations that are, are represented here as well because to me, it's, yeah, there's so much potential and I'm very inspired <laughs> hearing from, from all of these different stories and hearing from everyone here. Um, for me, I've been, uh, you know, I've, I, I started as an ecologist and, and through my work in Indonesia um, with, you know, fishing communities and in Kalimantan Tenga, um, I kind of moved up towards the social science side of things. And now I'm very excited about the idea of, yeah, um, hopefully doing some participatory video and maybe more courses with Sabine and Insight Share in the future. So, yeah, thank you, everyone. I'm super inspired by <laughs> all of this. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Good to, good to hear. Claudia, I see your hand is still up. Would you still like to make an additional? Oh, you're done. I'm just seeing it. So it's, it's, it's all good. Um, Nick. Yeah, just a last thing uh, to say, because of, I'm, of course, noticing that um, there, there are no uh, Africans here in, in this in this Zoom call, but there are um, num a number of people in from Southeast Asia and based in Southeast Asia. And um, that we are I'm having a meeting quite soon. I'm really excited uh, with our wonderful partner, long term partner, Seno from Nagaland, from Northeast Network, who's able to come to the UK on a, on a, on a trip for a conference. And we're going to spend the day together very soon uh, designing a fellowship program for Southeast Asia that's going to follow this same model. So that's what, something we would like to deliver next year if we can get the funding. And uh, just something to mention that, you know, it would be an absolute delight um, and make a lot of sense if we could work with some of you guys, um, you know, through you guys, uh, to, 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 to reach the right communities and work with you as the, in the kind of mentoring role. Um, you know, we, we can do something different. It's never going to be the same again. We'll, each time we have to 
uh, designed to a different context. But certainly in Nagaland, there's a huge d interest and demand. They, they really want to get more participatory video training at uh, Northeast Network and then to reach uh, other communities, indigenous communities across Northeast India. Um, and, it, you know, maybe we could include Cambodia, maybe we could include uh, Indonesia, do something across the region. It just, you know, I'd love to talk to anyone who's interested in, in you know, thinking about that. Um, maybe early in the new year, we could, we could have, a, have a call or just get in touch with me if you are interested in, and I can set up a call. Yeah, that, that's an amazing uh, idea, Nick. And it's always good to talk and share and learn more about what each of us is doing in, in their own uh, countries. Um, people can just drop their email in the chat, or if you're in the collective notes, you can just write your name and your organization and your email there. Um, I have also most of the emails and contacts of, of everyone here, so you can always come to me as well, Nick, but it would be good to just have it collectively uh, together. So everybody, please uh, drop your uh, your contact details there in the in the in the chat, and then we'll make sure it gets in the notes. Um, yeah, and and yeah, I think something like this could definitely work, uh, Nick. In in Asia, we and I, I'm just speaking from Indonesia alone. We also have this problem that it's just so hard to get to places, and the travel is very long. And there's 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 communities out there. In Indonesia, that even inside Indonesia might take me a day and a half to two days just to travel to the location because it's flying and then endless, you know, uh, car drives and then a boat again and then a motorbike drive and blah blah blah. And, and and if you could do things remotely, that would just be, you know, uh, amazing. And it 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 hasn't really been done before. This type of you know long term, a day a week. And you know, having that long perspective, um, I think is really unique. Um, and, and instead of, like you said, the short term, and then you don't see each other for a while. A lot of lot of things have changed. So, so I, I and I think Sabine's presentation also made that clear. I, I, I believe in this type of uh, engagement. It doesn't have to be super intense all the time, but it keeps going. There's assignments, there's, there's sort of benchmarks, milestones that you want to do. People get confident, people build trust. All these things happen over periods of time. And those things never happen in three days or in one week, so to say. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I look forward to more of, 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 of this type of engagement with uh, either indigenous or otherwise a very local communities um, in, in, in Southeast Asia or, or across the world, basically. Um, Sitten, oh, Sitten is already saying thank you. Yeah, we, I, let's look at the time. Oh, yeah, we're an hour 20. Nick, yeah, uh, go ahead. No, no, I was saying thank you to Sitten and because I think he has to go. So, yeah, bye. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just I think also we can... want, to, want to share if you want to watch the films or watch the Channel 4 News little segment. Um, Tanya can share, I think she already shared the link to our playlist, so please have a look. Um, you can have a wee insight into some of the work our hubs have been doing. Thanks everyone. It's lovely to meet you all and hear about your work. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And thank you so much to Engage Media, to Egbert in particular. Really uh, wonderful, lovely, friendly hosting. Uh, it's lovely to see you again. Yeah, yeah, really great. Thanks. Okay, so and and we've recorded this session, so we'll uh, we'll we'll share the recording to uh, yeah to whoever uh, requests it. I, I usually get a bunch of emails after the event of people that couldn't make it, and now I can finally send them the video. So that's uh, that's good. Thank you all for for joining this afternoon, evening, morning, from wherever you were. Thank you so much, Sabine, for sharing the story. Thank you, Inside Share, for uh, yeah, for being there and for just doing all this great work. And uh, I, I really look forward to uh, yeah, continuing uh, our 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 conversation in in other platforms, other times, and other circumstances. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Thank Demi. You, Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Buddy. Terima kasih ya. Terima kasih sama-sama.